The topic today is structure and function of the hematological system. Today we're going to delve into the technical details of the composition of blood. And we're gonna break it down into the key components and think about the roles and the body's function. The body is made up of blood, which is a complex mixture of cells and plasma. The plasma is a fluid that comprises about 91% water and 9% dissolved substrates. And in adults, the total blood volume is approximately 5.5 liters or equivalent to six quarts. And this constant circulation actually ensures that all the vital components reach the parts of the body that need these components so that they can carry out their respective functions. The primary functions of blood are as follows. So the first thing is nutrient and substrate transport. So what does this mean? It means that our blood actually acts as a transportation system and it delivers the essential substances that are required for cellular metabolism to all the tissues in our body. It's also responsible for waste removal and as it functions as a waste disposal system, it's gonna carry away the waste products that are generated by the cellular metabolism. It also has an immune response. Our blood is gonna serve as a defense mechanism, helping the body fight against invading microorganisms and supporting the healing process in case of injuries. And lastly, it has a pH balance function it provides maintenance by uh, maintaining the body's acid-base balance, and this is going to help optimize all our bodily functions. But now let's focus on the composition of plasma. Its main component is plasma protein, and these plasma proteins um, are going to be available to our body to carry out other functions as we're gonna see in later slides. The plasma itself constitutes around 50 to 55% of all the total blood volume and contains a range of both organic and inorganic elements. And these element concentrations can vary due to things like what people are eating, what their uh, metabolic demands are, hormonal regulation, and vitamins in the body. Lastly, it's really important for us to understand the difference or the distinction between plasma and serum. Serum lacks clotting proteins like fibrinogen. And so this makes it suitable for diagnostic tests where clotting factors might interfere. Now we're gonna look at more intricately the details of the plasma proteins. These proteins come in various forms and they have distinct roles. And primarily, they can be classified into two groups, the albumin and globulins, along with a small amount of clotting proteins, mainly fibrinogen. So notably, the liver is responsible for producing most of the plasma proteins in our body, with the exception of antibodies, which are produced by plasma cells, we call them B cells, and they're found in lymph nodes and other lymphoid tissues. So first we'll talk about albumin. Albumin consists of 57% of all the total plasma proteins. And the reason albumin is so important is because it is a carrier molecule for both regular blood components and drugs. And its main role is really in the regulation of the movement of water and solutes across the capillary system. And because albumin has a larger size, it isn't easily diffused through the vascular endothelium. But this is why we need it. Because of its size and as a result, it's able to maintain colloidal osmotic pressure, which is vital to our body. Osmotic pressure controls the movement of fluid and electrolytes within the surrounding tissues. 
and the ability to have um, osmotic pressure working appropriately will provide a balancing act where both our water and our solutes can move out of arterial systems, capillaries, and into higher blood pressure. So conversely, as they move from tissue into the venous capillary segments, this onconic pressure is going to exceed the intravascular or hydrostatic pressure. When there's any reduction in the albumin production, we can actually have a decrease in plasma onconic pressure. And when this happens, we're going to have an abnormal movement of water and solutes moving from our tissues. It's going to move into our tissue where we don't want it to be, but this is going to lead to reduced blood volume. When fluid moves into the tissue and we don't want it to be there, this is what causes edema or swelling. So we have to ask ourselves, what can actually reduce albumin production? Anything that insults the liver. Liver disease, cirrhosis, and even protein malnutrition can cause a loss of albumin production. Or if we have an excessive loss of albumin, this can also be seen in kidney disease as well. All right, so now we're gonna talk about globulins. The majority of the remaining plasma proteins, besides albumin, are globulins. They comprise around 38% of the total plasma protein content, and they are often characterized based on their behavior within the electrical field process called serum electrophoresis. So in this technique, albumin, being the most swiftly moving protein, is gonna set the standard for comparison. So our globulins are then gonna be classified according to their movement relative to albumin, how well they keep up, so to speak. So there are three main groups. There's the alpha, the beta, and the gamma. The alpha globulins, these proteins exhibit movement closest to albumin. So they're able to, to move almost as swiftly. Examples would be your HDLs, your high density lipoproteins. These transport hormones and prothrombin. The beta globulins, these group of proteins move at a so-so uh, pace, intermediately. These things would be like our LDLs, our, our low density lipoproteins. And then lastly, the gamma globulins, these are kind of the slow pokes. They're gonna show the least movement and primarily they reside in the gamma globulin region. Think about antibodies, which are vital components of our immune response. And then lastly, circling back to what makes up the remainder, which would be our clotting factors. And um, mainly this is going to be fibrinogen. Now, our plasma proteins can also be classified by function. Um, clotting factors, defense proteins, transport proteins, and regulatory proteins. So first we'll talk about the clotting factors. These proteins play a critical role in coagulation, which promotes the cessation of bleeding from any damaged blood vessel. Among them, fibrinogen is gonna stand out as being the most abundant. Fibrinogen acts as a precursor for the fibrin clot formation, and this is a key process in wound healing and hemostasis. The defense proteins, these are a group of dedicated proteins that safeguard the body against any type of infection. So think about antibodies, which are immune, we'll call them immune warriors, targeting specific invaders, and they complement um, proteins that assist in all the immune responses. So these elements will combine forces to provide this robust defense mechanism against all pathogens. And then we have transport proteins. They're designed for the efficiency and movement of substances throughout our body. They are essentially carriers. Think about transferrin, which transports iron. Uh, seroloplasmin, this handles copper. And lipoproteins, they specialize 
and moving around lipids and steroid hormones. We also have things like retinal binding proteins that help to transport vitamins, uh, such as vitamin A. And lastly, we have our regulatory proteins. And this category of proteins are also serving um, a very crucial role. We have enzymatic inhibitors like alpha-1 antitrypsin, which shields our tissues from any damage. Precursor molecules like kininogen, they transform into active biological agents when we need them. We also have protein hormones like cytokines. These act as cellular communicators, and this um, communication system will help facilitate the interaction between one cell and another cell. Additionally, we have um, plasma that contains several inorganic ions, and they also play pivotal roles in our cellular function as well. We have osmotic pressure, which we've talked a little bit about, and blood pH regulation. So all of these things together have a unique responsibility in helping to maintain the body's balance and its functionality. We also have red blood cells and white blood cells. Red blood cells are also commonly known as erythrocytes and WBCs or white blood cells are also called leukocytes. And then lastly, we have platelets. And so the next few slides will be talking about RBCs, WBCs, and platelets. So first let's dive into the components that comprise our blood, such as the RBCs. And erythrocytes are the most abundant cells in the blood. In a male, it actually will be about 48% of the overall blood volume, and in females, the proportion is about 42%. Pretty impressive because we have about 4.2 to 6.2 million erythrocytes per cubic millimeter that circulate through the normal blood at any given time. And these cells are on a mission. They're supposed to facilitate tissue oxygenation. So their mission is really important. Their key player is hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is a molecule that carries gases to our tissues. And for the mechanics, you think about electrolytes serving as regulators that manage this gas diffusion across the cell's plasma membrane. It's also important to note that once an erythrocyte is mature, it has to carry its mission pretty quickly because it's only going to live 100 to 120 days before it expires or it dies. So it's pretty brief lifespan. It's also really cool because there's this thing called reverse deformability. Because erythrocytes have a biconcave shape, they're able to squeeze into areas of the body and squeeze right back out. Think about the sinusoids in the spleen. It can uh, transform itself to fit through these areas and then reversibly deform, um, causing more surface space to open back up to provide more gas exchange. Within the composition of blood, we also have leukocytes. And their primary function is to defend the body against infection. It's also supposed to remove debris or dead or injured cellular components. And also it transports um, other components within the circulation. And it's primarily transporting and getting uh, other components that are needed into the tissues. In a typical adult, the count of leukocytes is going to range from 5,000 to 10,000 leukocytes per cubic millimeter of blood. So if you try to visualize these cells, they're pretty versatile protectors with two primary functions, phagocytosis and the immune response. 
they are spherical with irregular surfaces and they have extending pili, so they kind of move beyond their, um, their overall body. So if you think about in a microscopic world, leukocytes kind of resemble cotton candy, distinct from other blood components. The white blood cells are classified based on their structure as well, and we divide them into two groups, granulocytes and agranulocytes. The function divides them into phagocytes and immunocytes. Now granulocytes, these are a subset of WBCs that consist of neutrophils, basophils, and eosinophils. These are all able to act in phagocytosis. Agranulocytes, which is another category, they are the monocytes, the macrophages, but also they're responsible for phagocytosis as well. Then we have lymphocytes, which are immune cells that play a role in creating overall immunity. And we're gonna talk more about that in um, further chapters. Granulocytes are characterized by their nucleus. They are called polymorphonuclear because they have multiple lobes. So sometimes we might see PMN polymorphonuclear. And they have numerous membrane-bound granules in their cytoplasm. These are also key components of our immune response. These granules, they actually house enzymes that are capable for eliminating microorganisms. They help to break down the debris because they engulf the debris during phagocytosis. And the granules also harbor potent biochemical mediators that will help with inflammation and immunity. And so when there's specific stimuli, these mediators and enzymes can actually be released from the granulocytes and will be impacted and will also impact other cells in circulation. Now we're gonna get into, more specifically, the granulocytes. So starting with the PMN, or the polymorphonuclear neutrophils, uh, we will note that they are the most abundant and the most extensively studied among all of the granulocytes. They um, take over, for a, a Approximately 65 to 75% of the total leukocyte count are going to be PMNs. Neutrophils play a critical role in early inflammation like we've talked about. You think about neutrophils as being the initial responders to the scene of any type of bacterial invasion or tissue injury. Once the neutrophils can actually detect that there is a problem, they're going to leave the capillaries, they're going to migrate towards the damaged tissue. And their main objective is to engulf and eliminate all the invading microorganisms and the debris. They're remarkably sensitive to any type of altered environment and damaged tissue. So if you have a lower pH or there are other enzymes being released from damaged cells, they understand this and they know. Neutrophils typically only live one to two days and as they break down, the enzymes within their own granules are then re released and they dissolve into cellular debris and they prep that site for healing. Acinophils, they make up about two to 5% of the normal leukocyte count in adults. Um, they are large um, and they have coarse granules. These cells are equipped with a range of pattern recognition receptors. And they're capable of both amoeboid movement and phagocytosis. So unlike neutrophils and um, neutrophils that we talked about previously, eosinophils can actually ingest antigen antibody complexes that are triggered by the immunoglobulin E or the IgE mediated hypersensitivity reactions. Think about parasitic attacks. Their secondary granules mm -hmm. actually hold toxic chemicals that are highly effective against parasites and viruses. Additionally, these granules will contain various enzymes that will help with 
controlling inflammation. They also will release pro-inflammatory molecules like leukotrienes and prostaglandins, platelet activating factors, cytokines, and even chemokines. Basophils, these account for less than 1% of the leukocytes. Structurally, they resemble mast cells. These cells hold cytoplasmic granules that contain histamine, chemotactic factors, proteolytic enzymes, and an anticoagulant called heparin. And when basophils are stimulated, they synthesize a vasoactive lipid molecule and the cytokines. So now we're going to move on to A granulocytes. A granulocytes, these comprise of monocytes, macrophages, and lymphocytes. So unlike granulocytes, A granulocytes contain fewer granules. So it's kind of a misnomer. Just because it says A granulocytes doesn't mean that they don't have granules. They just have fewer. Let's talk about monocytes and macrophages. Now monocytes and macrophages, they are part of the mononuclear phagocytic system or the MPS. And these um, monocytes and macrophages, they're actually a duo that play a potent role in both immunity and inflammation. And they act as robust phagocytes. They excel at ingesting decrease or faulty host cells, particularly blood cells. Now think about monocytes as being the precursor to macrophages, the babies to the macrophages. Released by the bone marrow into the bloodstream, monocytes will then venture off into various tissues as they begin to mature. Some are going to become tissue macrophages, and they can be found in the liver, the spleen, the lymph nodes, the peritoneum and the GI tract. And then others can develop into macrophages and leave blood vessels in response to an infection or inflammation. Lymphocytes, they uh, constitute about 20 to 25% of the total leukocyte count and they take the center stage in terms of the immune response. Although most lymphocytes uh, initially circulate in the blood, they eventually settle in lymphoid tissues, maturing into T cells, B cells, and even plasma cells. And then lastly, the NK cells, or the natural killer cells, they're going to resemble lymphocytes. NK cells are unique though because they can actually target some of the tumor cells in vitro and virus infected cells without even previous exposures. Developing in the bone marrow and then moving through the bloodstream, natural killer cells play an essential role in our overall defense mechanism. Now, the last component we're gonna talk about is platelets. They're also known as thrombocytes. These aren't true cells, but instead they're irregularly shaped a nuclear cytoplasmic fragments. And despite having a non-cellular nature, platelets play a pivotal role in blood coagulation and bleeding control. So they're formed within the blood marrow through fragmentation of enormous cells called mega kerocytes. And they measure about 40 to 100 uh, micrometers in diameter. Platelets have a unique origin. Now, the megakaryocytes, you think of them as the parents of platelets. They undergo a specialized process to produce essential blood components. Platelets, in their compact structure, they house cytoplasmic granules. Um, they actually will, upon encountering injury to a blood vessel, the granules will then release adhesive proteins, coagulation factors, and growth factors which are gonna initiate the cascade of events crucial for clotting. And though they lack a nucleus, they're pretty versatile. They can change shape, they can adapt into different forms, they can um, extend adhesive properties, elongating surfaces. These extensions increase their surface area, which will then further facilitate adherence to collagen fibers 
within damaged vascular walls. The adhesion plug will, um, in the vascular openings, will actually help maintain the integrity of the circulatory system and staunch the bleeding in that area. Normally, your blood contains about 150 to 450 platelets per cubic millimeters. And so there's slight variations depending on your lab's reference ranges, of course. In addition to circulating platelets, about a third of the body's platelet supply is stored in the spleen as a reserve. A platelet has approximately 8 to 11 days to do its magic. And after that, macrophages, mostly within the spleen, are going to help remove the old platelets. So what's the problem with having too low a platelet count? You don't have enough fighters to help stop the bleeding, so you can have excess bleeding. Conversely, if you have a high platelet count, that means that you have a potential to have excessive clotting because you have too many platelets circulating within the blood supply. Now it's important to also uh, recognize the lymphoid organs, which are sometimes forgotten. We're gonna talk about the spleen and the lymph nodes. Primary lymphoid organs consist of the thymus and the bone marrow, and these organs are critical because they will help with processes like hematopoiesis and immune cell maturation. We also have secondary lymph organs. These secondary lymph organs, these are the spleens and the lymph nodes. Tonsils, we also think about pyre patches in the small intestines. Again, most of these things are forgotten. But these organs hold diverse functions, including filtering bloodborne antigens, they initiate immune responses to bloodborne microorganisms, and they help destroy aged erythrocytes, and they act as reservoirs for blood. So first we'll talk about the spleen, which is the largest of the lymphoid organ. It weighs about 150 grams, and roughly it's the size of your fist. The spleen holds a multitude of roles. It serves as a site for fetal hematopoiesis. It cleanses the blood via mononuclear phagocytosis. It triggers immune responses to bloodborne microorganisms, and it acts as a reservoir for your blood. The spleen is also defined by its concave encapsulated form. It has connective tissue strands, or trabeculi, that extend throughout the splenic capsule. These trabeculi will divide the spleen into little compartments containing a splenic pulp, both white and red. And um, the white pulp consists of lymphoid tissues like macrophages and lymphocytes, mainly T lymphocytes, um, in proximity to the arterioles. These arterioles are then encased by periarterial lymphoid sheets. And the splenic arterioles also give rise to cellular clumps known as lymphoid follicles. These are composed mainly of the B lymphocytes and are significant sites for immune function within the spleen. This is where bloodborne antigens engage with your lymphocytes actually, and they initiate immune responses and foster the transformation of lymphoid follicles into germal centers. This is all vital for B cell proliferation and differentiation during humoral immune responses. Now, within the red pulp, we have the venous sinuses. These are capable of storing over 300 milliliters of blood. When your blood pressure suddenly drops, the sympathetic nervous system or the SNS will then constrict these sinuses because it will have to release up to about 200 millimeters of that reserved blood into the venous circulation. And this is going to help replenish blood volume and pressure, and it can actually boost your hematocrit levels about 4%. It's kind of a storage facility. The venous sinuses are then lined with extremely permeable discontinuous endothelial lining, which can help facilitate the exit of blood cells. Red pulp also contains interconnected 
macrophages that serve as the primary site for splenic filtration. And within the slow moving sinuses, macrophages efficiently will phagocytose old, damaged, or dead red blood cells. They'll get rid of them um, and any other microorganism and debris that is left in there. While the spleen isn't indispensable for survival, it's actually the absences due various reasons can lead to several secondary effects on your body. So for instance, leukocytosis, which is an elevation of leukocytes in your blood, can often follow a splenectomy. This lets us know that the spleen's role in controlling the proliferation rate of leukocyte stem cells is important. Additionally, iron levels may decrease due to the spleen's involvement in the iron cycle. So the spleen's removal can lead to an increase in defective blood cells in circulation, letting us know that the spleen is actually a pretty important, not to be forgotten lymphoid organ. Now lymph nodes are part of the lymphatic system and they facilitate the maturation of lymphocytes they will also transport lymphatic fluid back into the circulation once it's been cleaned out um, as it's cleansing the lymphatic fluid of microorganisms and foreign particles. To get a little bit more in depth in the lymphatic system and lymph nodes, we have to understand that the lymphatic vessels are collectors which gather interstitial fluid from tissues and they transport it back through the lymph through vessels of increasing size. So we have the thoracic duct, which serves as a conduit that's gonna drain the superior vena, uh, it's gonna drain into the superior vena cava. And then it returns the lymph back into circulation and this process over and over again, it, it's a filtering process that moves lymph through this system. Each lymph node has a fibrous capsule and it branches and extends inward, forming trabeculi that partition the node into little compartments. Reticular fibers of connective tissue will actually weave throughout the lymph node, creating this distinct structure. The node itself is composed of an outer cortex and an inner paracortex. There's cortical areas and an inner medulla. The lymph enters through multiple small afferent lymphatic vessels into the subcapsular sinus and then it drains back into the cortical sinuses before it reaches the medullary sinuses. Then the lymph will exit the node via an efferent lymphatic vessel. The blood flows into the lymph nodes through the lymphatic artery and it ends in a group of postcapillary venules that will then spread throughout the outer cortex. This is where the drainage occurs through the lymphatic vein. What is the significance of lymph nodes? Functionality, lymph nodes are integral to both the hematological and the immune systems. They serve as the primary site for the first encounter between an antigen and a lymphocyte. So think of lymphocytes entering the nodes from the blood through postcapillary venules. This process is called diapedesis. And then macrophage, uh, macrophages, which will um, be within that lymph node already, they're gonna play essential roles in filtering that lymph or debris out, any foreign substances, microorganisms, and they will contribute to the antigen processing. Dendritic cells are gonna be responsible for actually encountering and processing the antigen itself. They enter the lymph node through the afferent lymph vessel and migrate within the node. This reticular network within the node is going to provide adhesive surfaces that will then trap the numerous phagocytes and lymphocytes. And they aid in their organizational um, follicles and primary nodules. So then in response, if there's an antigen that's present, they're gonna either be captured by a macrophage or presented by dendritic cells to other nodules or secondary nodules that will contain germinal centers. And within these germinal centers, lymphocytes, particularly the B lymphocytes, are gonna to respond to this antigenic stimulation. 
It's going to proliferate and differentiate, furthering into memory cells and plasma cells. And then these plasma cells will migrate into the medullary cords. The proliferation of B cells in response to a significant antigen um, during infection can actually lead to lymph node enlargement and tenderness. This is really important. It's because B cells are proliferating that you have this tender node or adenopathy. This is the reactive lymph node, and this is what it's supposed to do. And they will become palpable during a physical exam. Hematopoiesis is an intricate process responsible for the continuous production of blood cells. It's vital for our body's overall function. Hematopoiesis creates blood cells and it starts early. The production of blood cells actually takes place in the liver and the spleen of a fetus and post birth. And primarily it's going to occur within the bone marrow. This process is going to hinge on the orchestration of biochemical cues that stimulate populations of relatively undifferentiated cells undergoing mitotic division. And this will give rise to mature hematologic cells. It includes proliferation, which is cell division, and differentiation, which is maturation. This process will usually occur sequentially, but certain blood cells sometimes progress through stages concurrently. And think about erythrocytes and neutrophils. They generally complete their differentiation before entering the bloodstream. While monocytes and lymphocytes, they will actually continue their maturation within the bloodstream and secondary lymphatic organs. It's surprising, but the human body generates about 100 billion new blood cells every single day. There are two stages, uh, mitosis and maturation. Again, this is cell division and also called differentiation proliferation. We want to continue this process in response, and this continues throughout life to replace blood cells that grow old and die. So we need hematopoiesis to um, continue making up for what we are getting rid of. So as old blood cells are expiring, or they're being killed off by disease, or maybe they're being lost to bleeding, this system, this hematopoiesis, can actually um, revive and replenish the blood that is lost. To further illustrate this point, you can see in this figure the role of erythropoietin in the regulation of erythropoiesis. When there is decreased arterial oxygen levels, it's going to result in decreased tissue oxygen, which is hypoxia, and it's going to stimulate the kidney to increase the production of erythropoietin. Erythropoietin is carried then to the bone marrow and it's going to bind to erythropoietin receptors on proerythroblasts. This is going to result in increased red cell production, which is what we want. This increased release of red blood cells into the circulation will then correct the hypoxia in the tissue frequently. Perception of normal oxygen levels by the kidney will then cause diminished production of erythropoietin, which is the negative feedback loop, and it's going to return to normal levels of the erythrocyte production. EPO, erythropoietin, oxygen, oxygen in the blood and tissues, RBCs, and red blood cells all are interconnected by the regulation of erythropoiesis. So then we have to think about the process of hemoglobin synthesis. Erythrocytes or RBCs create hemoglobin within the bone marrow. The hemoglobin, the significant component that will um, consist of about 90% of our cells overall dry weight is responsible for transporting oxygen from our lungs to our tissues 
and then exchanging it for CO2 or carbon dioxide. Now hemoglobin is made up of globin polypeptide chains and heme complexes. The heme synthesized in the mitochondria will then bind with iron and oxygen. A single hemoglobin molecule will carry four oxygen molecules. This process is referred to as saturation. The various hemoglobin variants exist in um, distinguished polypeptide chains called hemoglobin A, which is the most common adult type. And hemoglobin A consists of two alpha and two beta chains. There's another variant, fetal hemoglobin, um, which is HBF, found in new, newborns, and they also have an alpha and gamma chains, two of each. Heme, with its iron core, will bind to oxygen, and when oxygen attaches to it, the hemoglobin will go through a structural change, and this is going to increase its affinity to oxygen. When the oxygen is released, hemoglobin's affinity starts to decrease, which will facilitate carbon dioxide transport. Carbon monoxide will compete with oxygen for iron binding, and this is going to affect oxygen transport. Hemoglobin interacts with carbon dioxide and nitric oxide and in the lungs, hemoglobin will bind to both oxygen and nitric oxide. And this is going to help with vessel dilation, oxygen release, then into the tissue. So think about hemoglobin synthesis and its function um, in a way that you understand its crucial role in the oxygen transport system. It's essential to understand the dynamic of the blood's oxygenation and how we eliminate carbon dioxide from our body. There are nutritional requirements that have to occur in order for erythropoiesis to take place. Normal development of erythrocytes and synthesis of hemoglobin really depend on having optimal biochemical states and adequate supplies of necessary building blocks, including proteins, vitamins, and minerals, as you can see um, in this chart. If these components are lacking for a prolonged amount of time, our erythrocyte production will then slow down, therefore triggering anemia, which is insufficient number of erythrocytes that are functioning appropriately. Mature erythrocytes have a cytoplasmic enzyme that's capable of glycolysis or anaerobic glucose metabolism and the production of small quantities of ATP. Remembering that ATP provides energy needed to maintain cell function and keep plasma membranes supplyable. Metabolic processes that will diminish as the erythrocyte ages, so less ATP is available to maintain plasma membrane function. So then we're left with the aged or senescent red blood cell, and it becomes increasingly fragile and it loses its ability for reversible deformability. It becomes susceptible to rupturing while passing through narrow regions within the microcirculation. Also, the plasma membrane of these senescent red blood cells undergo phospholipid rearrangement, and this will signal macrophages to come in and to selectively remove and sequester all the senescent red blood cells. Now, if the spleen is dysfunctional or absent, then macrophages in the liver, the Kupfer cells, will then assume the control of the process um, if the spleen is unable to do this. So it's, it's the backup, the Kupfer cells. During digestion of hemoglobin in the macrophage, um, we will have unconjugated bilirubin as a byproduct. Bacteria in the intestinal lumen will then transform the conjugated bilirubin into urobilinogen. This process is what will help remove the byproduct of 
um, the breakdown of RBCs, and it's usually the zero billion engine is going to be excreted in the feces. Sometimes there's conditions that will actually accelerate erythrocyte destruction and increase the load of serum unconjugated bilirubin. And by doing this, if we're increasing the load, it's going to actually increase the liver conjugation of bilirubin. And then now we have urinary excretion of urobilinogen. Um, For instance, if you have cholelithiasis or gallstones, this can actually result from chronic elevated rates of bilirubin excretion. About two thirds of our body resides in a red blood cell heme, and we have a small portion that lives in our muscle myoglobin. But about 30% is actually stored in cells as either ferritin or hemosiderin. Ferritin is, you think about it as a, uh, a place for iron to be stored. And when we consume or absorb more iron than we need, the body is gonna store this excess iron as a molecule called ferritin. Now ferritin will be kept safe in a way until we need it. And that way it's not gonna harm our body because free iron will actually damage our body and is very toxic, okay? So unbound iron. So instead our body will reserve this and keep it as ferritin for later. And when our body needs it, the new red blood cells um, need to be formed, or if we need other functions that require iron, then the ferritin will open up so that we can use the stored iron. So think about ferritin as helping to manage our iron levels to make sure that we don't have too much and that we have enough when we need it. Hemosiderin is like a warehouse for iron as well. When our old red blood cells break down, they actually will release iron. And then this iron is collected and stored as hemosiderin. We're putting it away for later. The body then can tap into this storage warehouse when it needs to create new red blood cells. So hemosiderin also helps to keep our iron levels balanced and ensure that the um, erythropoiesis or blood making process is running smooth. Now transferrin transports iron to erythroblasts in the bone marrow so that it can be used for hemoglobin production. And hepcidin is a liver produced hormone that controls our iron hemostasis. It binds to ferro um, portin which is an exporter of iron into the cells. And the um, hepcidin's level is regulated by our body's iron, our erythropoiesis rate, and our oxygen saturation. It's going to reduce iron absorption by degrading ferroportin, increasing intracellular iron, and decreasing dietary iron absorption. It's important to note that our body only requires about 25 milligrams of iron a day for erythropoiesis. You can also look at these two images in your textbook to get a little bit more clarity on the iron cycle. The first figure on the left shows the metabolism of bilirubin released by the heme breakdown. You see, you have the senescent red blood cell, it's consumed by macrophages, and then during digestion, the porphyrin and the RBCs will be reduced to bilirubin. Now bilirubin is gonna be taken up by the liver where it's either conjugated and then excreted as bile. Bacteria in the intestines will transform this conjugated bile into urobilogen, which is then excreted primarily by the feces. And we also have the mononuclear phagocyte system to dispel of unwanted bilirubin. The next figure talks about iron being released from the GI epithelial um, tract into the bloodstream. And you can see it's associated with the plasma carrier 
it has to bind to something. So it's binding to transferrin. It's being delivered to a rhizoblast in the bone marrow where most of it can then be used um, and incorporated into the hemoglobin. Mature erythrocytes will then circulate for about 128 days and then they become senescent and they're removed by the um, mononuclear phagocyte system or the MPS. These macrophages, um, mostly found in the spleen, will then break down ingested erythrocytes and then return that iron back into the bloodstream directly or after it's being stored as ferritin or hemosiderin. Now we're going to move on to the development of leukocytes. These are diverse white blood cells that are crucial for our immune response. And we have something called myelopoiesis, which involves the formation of granulocytes in neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils, and monocytes. And these cells originate from the myeloid progenitor cell in the bone marrow. There's growth factors that guide their maturation. And with 10 to 14 days, granulocytes will then be released into the blood and they form two different groups. They're either going to be the circulating functional cells and the marginating storage pool um, that live along the, the vessel walls. And these mainly consist of neutrophils. The monocytes are then going to be released as well, and they will transform into tissue macrophages and dendritic cells within a couple of days. Lastly, we have lymphopoiesis, which leads to lymphocytes which are important immune cells as well. The lymphoid progenitor cells will then enter the bloodstream and mature further in primary and secondary lymphoid organs, and they have varied lifespans ranging from days to even years. But during infection, the numbers can increase to an amount um, that will help um, become a stronger defense um, during immunity.
Under normal conditions, the endothelial cells will actively regulate our blood flow and they will deter spontaneous activation of platelets and the clotting system. And they do this by nitric oxide and other antithrombotic molecules. So nitric oxide is produced by the endothelial cell and it acts as a potent vasodilator which will help control blood flow and pressure and it keeps platelets in a resting state. And it partners up with other vasodilators as well to magnify the effect. The endothelial cell surface will house molecules like um, glycosaminoglycans, such as heparin sulfate. We also will see plasminogen activators as well. And these molecules play an essential role to preventing excessive platelet activation and um, the deposition of fibrin, the protein that's involved in clot formation. However, in cases where there's vessel damage, it changes a little bit. When there's damage that occurs, the endothelial barrier then becomes compromised and it activates the remaining endothelial cells due to the tissue damage products. This leads to exposure of the underlying subendothelial matrix. Endothelial cells will harbor structures that, uh, structures that contain von Willebrand factor. This is also known as clotting factor eight. This van Willebrand um, factor is released during vascular injuries and it contributes to platelet activation. Now reviewing the function of a platelet. It helps to regulate blood flow into a damaged site by inducing vasoconstriction. So it's going to help control the bleeding and limit the extent of injury. It's going to initiate that platelet to platelet interaction. So it results in the formation of a platelet plug and it's just the initial kickstart um, and it's just the initial barrier to prevent further bleeding. It's going to activate the coagulation or the clotting cascade to uh, stabilize that platelet plug. And this cascade includes the formation of fibrin, um, which helps with clot formation. And then it initiates a repair process, including clot retraction, and finally, the dissolution of the clot, which is called fibrinolysis. Um, this release of growth factors that aid in the repair of the damaged tissue in this process will actually uh, promote this clot dissolution. It's also important to note the normal platelet count ranges from 150 to about 400,000 platelets per cubic milliliter. And thrombocytopenia, which is when we have a drop below 100,000, can result in prolonged clotting times. And so therefore you're more prone to spontaneous bleeding. But um, major bleeding episodes are rare unless actually the platelet count dips below uh, 20,000. We're gonna talk a little bit more about the platelet plug formation in more detail. There are the three A's of platelet plug formation, adhesion, activation, and aggregation. So adhesion, in normal situations, platelets are gonna glide along through the vessel walls and they kind of roll through, but when there's a vessel that's injured, the platelets will adhere to that injury. And then the endothelial cells will release the von Willebrand factor and will reduce their antithrombotic effects. This adherence is primarily driven by glycoprotein um, IB on platelets and von Willebrand factor. With activation, we have interactions with the endothelium and the subendothelial matrix and inflammatory mediators that activate the platelets. And this leads to very dramatic changes that reorganize the cytoskeleton. It alters the platelet shape with the spiny projections and degranulation, and potent biochemicals are then released. These granules will then um, 
uh, change the platelets to make them sticky and they adhere to the cellular spreading for tight contact and they externalize um, all the activating clotting factors. With aggregation, we have um, platelet aggregation primarily being driven by uh, this thing called thromboxine A2 and EDP. They trigger fibrinogen receptors on platelets, particularly at the glycoprotein complex, and it undergoes a conformational change that will enable the binding of fibrinogen and other matrix proteins. This complex activation will then form platelet aggregates. So when the vessel injury is just minor, platelets achieve hemostasis by just forming a platelet plug, and this usually only takes about three to five minutes. This temporary plug will then seal the, mascro, uh, excuse me, the microvascular ruptures, and then this is gonna help prevent excessive bleeding. When there's a deficiency in platelets, it's going to result in purpuras. And we remember from health assessment that purpuras are small hemorrhagic areas under the skin and the tissue. A blood clot is a network of protein strands that reinforces the platelet plug. It entraps various cells like erythrocytes, phagocytes, and microorganisms. Fibrin is the main component of these strands and it's generated by the clotting or coagulation system. The coagulation system is a group of proteins that circulate in an inactive form within the bloodstream. But when it's activated, the proteins will then initiate a cascade of events that will culminate into the creation of what we call a fibrin clot. The clotting system is often illustrated as two different pathways, the intrinsic and the extrinsic pathways. And at some point they converge into a common pathway. The intrinsic pathway starts with the plasma's Hangeman factor, or factor 12. Contacts negatively charge subendothelial surfaces exposed due to vessel injury. The in, uh, extrinsic pathway, on the other hand, is initiated when the tissue thromboblastin released by damaged endothelial cells interacts with clotting factors like um, clotting factor uh, 7 primarily. Both pathways will converge to activate factor 10, which sets the stage for clot formation. And just like the complement cascade, the clotting system is intricate. It involves various activators and inhibitors, and there's a lot of cross communication or cross talk between the intrinsic and extrinsic pathways. As a result, it forms again one pathway converging at factor 10 to activate the other members of the um, coagulation or clotting system. So what happens to a blood clot after, after it's formed? And how does our body manage the retraction and then the eventual dissolution of a clot? So retraction is, uh, the situation is when the clot forms, it undergoes a process called retraction because the fibrin strands that have held the clot together will start to shrink and become more compact and robust. This retraction brings the edges of the injured vessels closer together, effectively sealing that injury site. And platelets actually play a significant role in this mechanism. They're embedded within the fibrin me uh, meshwork and they help with the contraction or the tugging. These fibrin threads are gonna tug, tug, tug nearer to each other, releasing a factor that's going to reinforce the stability of the fibrin. This process starts shortly after clot formation and typically um, it will last about 20 to 60 minutes. During this time, serum is expelled from the clot due to contraction. We also have to think about lysis of the clots. The breakdown of blood clots is then facilitated by the fibronolinic system. Plasminogen, which is a plasma protein, is converted into plasmin its active form. And so it's converted through various coagulation and inflammation products, particularly tissue plasminogen activator, or T-PA. Endothelial cells express um, this 
TPA, which is optimally activated after binding to fibrin. And of course, there's other activators of plasminogen. There's urokinase, a like plasminogen activator, or UPA. And when this binds to specific cellular receptors, it will activate plasminogen um, as well. In certain cases, uh, cancers will actually exploit the um, urokinase-like plasminogen activators and they will break down the extracellular matrix and this facilitates tumor invasion and metastasis. Uh, fibrin degra uh, de uh, degradation also will happen and the byproduct is a uh, D-dimer. And so when we look at um, blood work and we're looking at D-dimer, we're actually measuring the degradation product of this process. We're going to move into a section on clinical evaluation and we can test by blood and we can test by bone marrow. So first we'll talk about bone marrow aspiration and biopsy, which are common methods for evaluating the bone marrow function. Now aspiration involves extracting small samples of liquid bone marrow from the sternum um, or the pelvis. And when we have a biopsy, it actually is removing tiny pieces of bone marrow along with the bone that's surrounding that area. Now both methods um, actually provide valuable information, but the biopsy offers a little bit more reliable information and more comprehensive insights about the bone marrow's overall condition. However, there's a trade-off. So while bone marrow biopsies offer more accurate and detailed information, it's also associated with more discomfort and it costs more. Patients may find the procedure pretty painful and um, depending on healthcare resources, we might have to um, you know, actually get a biopsy versus an aspiration. In some cases, aspiration is okay and we can um, just do an aspiration instead. Bone marrow iron stores can also be measured and we can also determine the differential cell counts um, by getting a um, bone marrow aspiration or biopsy. Now blood tests are a little bit more common um, and they can also give us comprehensive insights. They provide information about absolute numbers, relative numbers of blood cells, and we can also see structural and functional characteristics. They provide initial justification for some um, of our um, further therapies and interventions. And when we decide we need a bone marrow aspiration or um, biopsy, we're first looking at the blood tests. And as you can see from this list, which is not comprehensive, but pretty extensive, um, there are a large variety of blood tests that are available. There are a diverse range of tests. In the world of hematology, we see that we can look for aspects of RBCs, WBCs, platelets, hemoglobin, um, hematocrit, uh, iron, you know, and the list goes on and on. And you can see here in your book, it does break it down nicely into um, a lot of the different um, subcategories of blood tests that can be performed. And lastly, we're going to end with just spending a little bit of time and noting the differences in the hematological system between pediatrics and um, our aging adults. Um, in pediatrics, the blood cell count will actually increase above adult levels at birth, and this can be because of birth trauma or when we cut the umbilical cord and we have this extra surge of blood um, and serum moving into the baby's body. Full-term neonates actually have more immature erythrocytes. They're known as reticulocytes. 
And over time, the lifespan of these erythrocytes will change 60 to 80 days. And then for full term infants, um, or 60 to 80 days, and then shorter if they're premature babies, uh, like 20 or 30 days. Children actually also possess clotting factors that diminish the risk of thrombotic disease and complication. So frequent viral infections give um, rise to more atypical lymphocytes in children. Neutrophil counts are initially high at birth, and then they surge during the first days, and then they dip by the end of the second week, and then they kind of normalize at about uh, four to five years old. In terms of eosinophils and monocytes, um, eosinophils will peak at the first year, and then they're a little bit higher, um, and then um, you know as they become teenagers and adults, they will level off. And monocytes are pretty similar. Um, as well, they're elevated that first year and then they taper off. In terms of our oldies but goodies, or our aging population, the erythrocyte lifespan is pretty normal, but when they are replaced, they're replaced more slowly. And there's possible causes like iron depletion, um, there may be a decreased total serum iron in the body or iron binding capacity as well and the body's ability to actually absorb iron. Your lymphocyte function will also decrease with age. Um, it tends to decline both with the T cell or cellular immunity and also in the uh, humoral immune system. So that antibody-based immunity or B cell immunity will also decrease in its responsiveness as well.